You can be seated. Well, today we come to the final message in a study of the book of 2 Samuel. We're in 2 Samuel this morning. Next Sunday, Justin Taylor, a friend of mine, will preach for us in connection with our Claris Conference that's happening this coming Friday evening and Saturday. I'll say more about Claris at the end of the service, but next week, Justin will be preaching for us. And then following our Claris Conference, Lord willing, we'll begin a study of the New Testament book of James, the book of James. Here at Desert Springs, we preach through books of the Bible because that's what God has given us, not an encyclopedia or a topical index, but books of the Bible, letters. And we usually bounce from the Old Testament to the New Testament and from the New Testament to the Old Testament because God has given us both. We have 39 books of the Old Testament which promise and anticipate the coming of the Christ, the King. And we have 27 books of the New Testament which describe his coming and tell us how to live in light of it. They show us what it means to follow the King in everyday life. And the book of James does that as practically as any other book in the New Testament. Today, as we close out an Old Testament book, we have one which, as much as any other Old Testament book, promises the coming king, anticipates the coming king, the final king. We must always remember that the Old Testament has not just been given to us for moral tales about the beauty of salvation and the heartbreak of sin. Old Testament stories, like we find in 2 Samuel, first and foremost focus on the need for a king, the coming of a king, the need for a better king. First and 2 Samuel, really together one book, they have many stories in them, many scenes in it, but they make up one grand story. They tie in even to one grand story. And so the book before... The book of Judges ended in this foreshadowy way. It tells us how to read First and Second Samuel. Judges ended by saying, in those days, there was no king in Israel. No king. And everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So we turn a couple pages and we start hearing about this godly woman, Hannah, who miraculously bears a son. And somehow at that moment, God had given her the faith to realize that something big was happening in God's plan, that Aslan was on the move, and God was about to act, to purify his people, to judge the enemies, and to set up his promised king. She prayed, he will guard the feet of his faithful ones. Hannah said, the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. God was about to act, and to act primarily through a man, his man, a man of his own choosing, a man after his own heart, his king, his anointed. It wasn't Saul. He was a king like the nations. He was one of the people's choosing and their timing. But David, we learn about some chapters later, He's the man of God's own choosing. He's a man after God's heart. He's the last born of his brothers. He was in a family living in little old Bethlehem. Nothing looked regal about it. But the lowly are being raised up, Hannah said. The lofty are being brought down low, Hannah said. And last week we saw David putting the poetic capstone on God's working and God's promises. 2 Samuel 22 and 23 have two poems of David. Again, a poetic capstone on God's promises to him and through him for his people. They summarize all that God had done. Had done, past tense. Hannah talked about what God will do. David talked about what God had done. And with those two poems there at the end of 2 Samuel, it would seem like that would be a fitting ending for the book. In fact, 2 Samuel 23, verse 1, even begins 
These are the last words of David. And yet they are not the last words of 2 Samuel. We have two more snapshots of the life of David still to go. They further summarize the life of David. They further summarize God's work in him and through him and sometimes in spite of him. So let's start with the remainder of chapter 23, verse 8 and following. We're here, we get the first snapshot. It's an account of the king's mighty men. The king's mighty men. Really what we have in verse 8 and following is not much more than a list of 37 names of David's elite soldiers. I won't read it all to you, partly because I don't know how to pronounce most of the names. I didn't practice it, and I'm not sure I could remember even if I did. Let me just point out a few things about these men, and then we'll read verses here or there to see it for ourselves. These were valiant men. These were courageous men. These were brave men. These were successful warriors. Like verse 8, Josheb Bashabeth. See what I mean? Josheb Bashabeth was the chief of the three, and he wielded his spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. One guy, 800 dead, not with a machine gun, not with a sniper rifle, but with a spear. Or how about Shema in verse 11? I'm sorry, let's go to verse 9 and see Eleazar. Eleazar, one day against the Philistines. It says in verse 9, the men of Israel withdrew. And then verse 10, Eleazar rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword. They had to pry it off. Shema in verse 11. Another occasion when the men fled from the Philistines. Then verse 12, he took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines. You know what he defended? Lentils. Lentil soup. No one's going to get my lentils, he said, and he struck down a bunch of Philistines all by himself. These three made up the elite of the elite. The whole group together, even though there were 37 of them, had the nickname, The Thirty. And you know what the three were called? The Three. It's not clever nicknaming, <laughs> but that's just the kind of men we're dealing with here. These are warriors. These are practical men. They go by the names The Thirty and The Three. They're like their king, who once went to fight that giant Philistine Goliath when all the other Israelite soldiers were safely in their camp up on the hill, hearing the taunts day after day, day after day, and not going down to battle, David went. And so these three warriors are like that. They go when no one else will go. They stay and fight when everyone else flees. Courageous men, valiant men, but they are dependent men. Dependent men. It wasn't their sheer strength or their skill or, or their sheer will that won the day. God won the day. Twice we're told the determinative factor in these mini battles. Verse 10 and verse 12. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day. In verse 12, and the Lord worked a great victory. Here we have a major theme for the books of Samuel. May we never forget David's, some of his first words in the book. There before the Goliath, he said, the giant Goliath, he said in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, you come to me with sword and spear and with javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with spear or sword, for the battle is the Lord's. May we not forget those early words from Hannah in her prayer where she said, it's not by might that a man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord will be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder. And let us not forget some of the last words of the book. What we saw last week in chapter 22, 
that the Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High uttered his voice, and he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and routed them. These men were skilled men, yes, brave men, yes, but they were the Lord's men. And unless the Lord keep it, keep, keeps watch, the watchmen watch in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders build in vain. And unless the warriors have the Lord with them, well, they war in vain. They were devoted men. Look at verse 14 and following, where we get some storytelling in between the record of names. It says, David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. And David said longingly, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. Then the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and carried and brought it to David. You can imagine David being homesick on the battlefield, imagining Bethlehem, his home. Maybe he missed the familiar taste of Bethlehem's wells. And maybe he missed it out loud. Maybe not even expecting anyone to hear, let alone anyone to go and do anything about it. After all, Bethlehem was 17 or 18 miles away from where they were at this point. At that time, Bethlehem was filled with Philistines. They had encamped there. But these three men... They care more for their king's comfort than their own lives. And so they go. And they don't go at night with the cloak of darkness and sneak their way into the well. They apparently go in the day. They go straight on. They fight their way in, hacking Philistines all the way to the well that David was talking about. And they get to the well and they get the water and no doubt have to hack their way through Philistines to get out of there. And 17 or 18 miles back to where David was and here they come with water for the king. Look on in verse 16, there in the middle. But he would not drink of it. He poured it out to the Lord. And said, far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who, sent, who, who went at the risk of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. That looks ungrateful to us. It looks wasteful maybe. Or it just looks plain dumb. But this was a way of honoring what they had done. The water was too precious to be swallowed and digested in David's mind, it must be sacrificed. It was holy. It's the Lord's. It wasn't precious because it was Bethlehem water, good as that might taste. It was precious because these men risked their lives. It's as if their blood was on it because they almost died for the king's wish of Bethlehem water. So David was honored by what they did. And so he honored them, and they worshiped together as it was poured out. I love this section of God's word. At first, it looks like just a string of names. And I wish we could spend a whole Sunday on this. Just this bit. For all the warm, manly, encouraging things about this record, it ends in a minor key. A minor key. Look down at verse 34. We're given a name there, Eliam. That's the father of Bathsheba. The last one on the list is Uriah the Hittite. Who could forget that Uriah was the wife of Bathsheba? I think the writer here wants us to recall the whole sordid affair. David and his adultery. The cover-up. The killing of Uriah, her husband. We're also to remember at this point the confrontation to David and his repentance and forgiveness. But we're also to remember the chastisement. That's been unfolding for, I don't know, a dozen chapters or so at this point. And yet we're also supposed to remember at this point by the name Uriah, as that rings in the air, not just the bad stuff, not just the hard stuff, but the sweet stuff. Forgiveness, and yet 
unthreatened promises. At the end of the story, here we have the king still on his throne. God promised, when he sins, I will discipline him, but I will not take away my steadfast love from him. Here's proof. David's 30 men in their glorious battles. David was once just the one lad who would risk life and limb for the nation and go fight a giant alone. But here at the end, there is a whole delta force of elite people like that, just like David. And God is using them, giving them victory. 2 Samuel 23 makes me want to buy a sword. It makes me want to, makes me want to find a jujitsu class or, or start a fight club here at the church. It makes me want to do something manly. It's a manly chapter. It made me this week go back and read Lord Tennyson's poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade, about the 600. When can their glory fade? Oh, wild charge they made. All the world wondered. Honor the charge they made. Honor the light brigade, the noble 600. I wish Tennyson had written that about the 30. But then I thought of John 18, when Jesus was in the garden and they came for him for his arrest. I remembered that Peter probably just woke up Perhaps he was dreaming about being one of the 30. And he swung swords, didn't he? He went for the enemy's head and only got an ear. And then Jesus rebuked him. Jesus told him that this is not the way anymore. The kingdom is now coming not through sword or spear, but through sacrifice and the cross. Jesus said in that same chapter, his kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then his men would have fought. But his kingdom is not of this world. The kingdom is advanced now through humility and a cross. Hold that thought, and we'll come back to that at the end. Back to David, and on to the next scene in chapter 24. Chapter 24, starting in verse 1, reads... Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go number Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba, and number the people, that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of my lord the king still see it. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing? But the king's word prevailed against Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. And they went all through the land. We can go ahead and just skip down to, to verse 9. They went all over the land. In verse 9 it says, Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to the king in Israel, there were 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000. Secondly, we have the king's mysterious sin. It was first the king's mighty men, now the king's mysterious sin. It's mysterious because a few questions should be raised by verse 1 alone. Why was God angry at Israel at this time? Well, we're simply not told. He must have had reasons for his displeasure. It was not an infrequent thing. Hence the word, again. Again, he was angry with them. And so we learn that God was going to use David as an instrument of judgment upon his sinful people. And how? Well, God would incite David to sin, it says. That leads to the second question. How could God incite David to sin and not sin himself? Isn't this sinful for God to incite someone for sin? Or even we could ask, what, what does it mean that he incites? In the parallel of 1 Chronicles 21, it says there that Satan incited David to sin in this way. I think that sort of adds to the complication of this scenario instead of simplifying it because they can't uh, be true individually. They have to be true together. 
So how is God, Satan, and David involved in all of this? Well, these are deep theological weeds, but there's some things we can start putting in place here, puzzle pieces we can start laying down about a theological picture. We can say that God is not the author of sin. That's clear elsewhere. We can say from James 1 that God doesn't tempt anyone. He doesn't tempt. But we can also say from all over the Bible that we know God is sovereign. Not kind of sovereign, but completely sovereign over the falling of hairs and the, the death of birds. He's sovereign. He's not just sovereign over the good stuff. So Joseph can say after his brothers so greatly sinned against him, when, they, when he saw him, he said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. They meant it for evil, God meant the same thing for good. We know that God is sovereign, not just over circumstances, but even human wills. Joseph's brothers, kings of this world, Proverbs 21 says, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he will. And yet we also know from all over the Bible that our decisions are real decisions, and they are culpable or blamable. We're responsible for them. As we'll see in this chapter, David comes to see that his sin was his sin. His choice, his responsibility. And God will agree. All this is mysterious, but we have to insist, like the Bible does, that God is 100% sovereign and man is 100% responsible. It's not 50% God and 50% us. It's not sometimes God is sovereign and sometimes you are. It's not that God is sovereign over the big things but he lets you like pick your socks out of your own free will and he doesn't even care. Oh no, no, it's 100% him and we are 100% responsible. Theologians have a big word for this. They call it concurrence, concurrence or compatibilism. It just means that two realms are concurrently happening at the same time or that two things are compatible at the same time. God's sovereignty in our responsibility. It helps to look at the cross. How did the cross come about? Jesus' crucifixion, what led up to that? Judas' betrayal? Yeah, that was a big part of it, right? The religious leaders in their unbelief, even their growing jealousy for popular Jesus, that was part of it. The way they interpreted Old Testament scriptures was part of it. The Romans' nervousness about another Jewish revolt, pleasing the mob who kept crying, crucify, crucify. The soldiers who nailed Jesus to the cross. All those people were guilty. They all made conscious choices to conspire against Jesus unto his death. But that's not all. So Peter can preach in Acts chapter 2, saying, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed. You killed him. It was God's plan all along. Both are true. Now, you need to know also that God doesn't make sinners sin. He can just decide to keep sinners, to, to not keep sinners from their sin. Did you know that's one of the things God does? He restrains evil in this world. I mean, apart from that, do you know you'd be worse than you are? Hitler famously loved his dog and dogs in general. He, he could have, even Hitler could have been worse. He could have been a dog killer. At least he had that going for him. You see, God, God doesn't make people sin. He at times allows them to sin. Romans 1 talks about this, that one of the ways he judges sin is by giving us over to our sin. Not making us sin, but just letting go. Imagine like there's a sin magnet that we're all drawn to. And God in his kindness and faithfulness, he, he pulls on that. All the time, he pulls on that. And every now and then, he just lets it go. For his mysterious purposes. He's not threatened by evil. And yet he doesn't do evil. That's what we have in 2 Samuel 24. God allowing Satan to incite David to sin, allowing David to be tempted and to sin, 
in order that he might bring judgment upon sinful Israel for his holy, glorious ways. But another question still remains, even right out of the gate of chapter 24. Why was it sin for David to take a census for him to count the people? Censuses, in general, are not sinful. God told his people to count them up many times before. There's a whole book of the Bible called Numbers. You know why it's called Numbers? Because of all the censuses that are in it. And we just got done reading about 30 men. You might notice there are 37, they're called the 30. It's not because of bad counting. I mean, it's a group that, you know, was sort of ebbing and flowing over the years, with some dying and others being replaced. And, but you got men who are being counted in the story we just saw. God isn't against counting. And so we're not told exactly why this was sin for David to do. But we get a hint in Joab's protest to the king in verse 3. He says, why does my lord the king delight in this thing? Why has to do with motives. Delight. Why would you take pleasure in this? Considering the themes of First and Second Samuel, how they're repeated over and over, you, you have to see that what must be going on at a motive level as David asks for a count of the soldiers is that he's counting on the numbers, trusting in the numbers, trusting in the tally. He had momentarily forgotten Hannah's thesis It's not by might that a man will prevail. He had momentarily forgotten his own words before Goliath that the Lord saves, not with sword or spear. The battle's the Lord's. Jonathan modeled the right kind of faith so well. Back in 1 Samuel 14, he was alone with his armor bearer with Philistines close by, and he said, let's go attack them because the Lord might give us favor for the Lord saves by many and by few. And a little bit later, 20 Philistines are dead and the ground quakes and the rest of them run away. But here, David isn't thinking like Jonathan or like his former self. He wanted to know how big his army was and that's not always wrong, but sometimes it is. It is not wrong for you to know how much money is in your checking account. In fact, that would be a good thing for you to know You should balance your budget and all that. It's not wrong for you to look at your statement about investments and see where it is. But it can be. It can be. What do you number up? What are you counting on? What army in your life are you really counting on? When do you feel strong and secure? And what makes you feel strong and secure? Whatever that is, hear Joab's plea. Why do you delight in this thing? David wouldn't hear Joab's plea. And so for almost 10 months, the counting went on, and then the tally was brought to King David. And let's read on in verse 10. But David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I've sinned greatly in what I've done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, thus says the Lord, three things I offer you. Choose one of them that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him and said to him, Shall three years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I'm in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So thirdly, we see the king's repentance in faith. We saw the king's great sin. Now we see the king's repentance in faith. 
We've seen this king sin before and repent before, back in chapter 12, 11, and 12. This time, it's even more encouraging, no confrontation was needed. The prophet came after, G, after David had already felt conviction. His heart was struck, it said. He went to God in prayer. He confessed his sins to the Lord. He expressed sorrow for those sins. He said, I have sinned greatly. He called it sin. He didn't minimize it. He told God he had done foolishly, which doesn't mean like being silly. It means pervertedly, upside downly. He asked God to remove the iniquity, to remove the guilt. He recognized he didn't just sin, but there was guilt. What a different kind of king this is than his predecessor. When Saul was confronted, uh, he dismissed the sin. He minimized the sin. He blamed others instead. But here David owns his sin. And he brought his sin to the one he sinned against. The one who can do something about it. And that's what repentance is. Repentance is sorrow for sin and turning to God that he might do something about it. It's not just sorrow. It's not just confession. It's not just owning it. It's not just feeling bad. It's talking to God. It's turning to God. It's asking for forgiveness. And with him there is forgiveness. But that doesn't mean that there are always no consequences with his forgiveness. There's, there's chastisement. We saw that in 2 Samuel 12. God forgave David of his sin. He didn't remove his steadfast love. But there was chastisement for years and years to come. Remember in this case, God was using David's sin to chastise a sinful nation. And that's still to come. And so the prophet Gad shows up with a, a menu of three punishment options. David, do you want three years of famine? Do you want three months of losing to the enemy? Or do you want three days of pestilence, of plague, of disease? And David's answer exhibits even greater faith than before, I think. He says in verse 14, I'm in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. I think David excludes the second option of warring with the enemy. That's the hand of man. But he trusts the hand of God even while he knows chastisement and judgment is about to come. If you had to choose the judgment of God or the judgment of Philistines, what would you take? I'd be tempted to take Philistines. Wouldn't you? I mean, God's not a Philistine. He's much, much bigger. He makes Philistines. Right? He's greater than. Put a greater than sign here. But that's forgetting his character. With him, there's mercy. His mercy is great. David knows this man, David, uh, this God. He trusts this God. And he trusts God with the kind of punishment, with the degree of punishment, and with the length of punishment. And it was right that he could trust God. And yet God's chastisement was nevertheless severe. Look at verse 15. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand towards Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aranah, the Jebusite. Pestilence. Disease something like bubonic plague for the appointed time, maybe three days, maybe less, maybe in his great mercy, God relented before three days. Nevertheless, whatever time it was, it was enough, and the angel stopped, and 70,000 were dead. Can you just picture that? 
Fourthly, we come to the king's significant intercession. The king's significant intercession. Now, before I read this section to you, I have to explain that verse 17 in following chronologically goes somewhere between verses 15 and 16. Look down on your Bible to see if you can see this. By verse 16, the plague had already ceased, right? But in verse 17, David is going to be watching the plague still happen. Somehow he can actually see the angel carrying out the destruction. And it's not until verse 25 that we're again told that the plague stopped. It didn't stop twice. It's just that we get two tellings of the story. One, the bare facts, and another, the inside scoop of how it went down with David. Here's how it went down with David. Verse 17. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I've sinned greatly and I've done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aranah the Jebusite. So David went up at God's word as the Lord commanded. And when Aranah looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming on towards him. And Aranah went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. And Aranah said, Why is my lord the king come to this servant? David said, to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be averted from the people. And Aranah said to David, let my Lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Aranah gives to the king. And Aranah said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. But the king said to Aranah, no, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land and the plague was averted from Israel. This is the king's significant intercession. And it is significant in many, many ways. David doesn't know that the nation has sinned and that there's judgment upon him. And so he stands in the gap, as it were, for these sheep. He's ever the shepherd, isn't he? These sheep. He prays for God's hand of judgment to be upon him. And not them. And it was that day, verse 18 says, that God sent the prophet Gad to David with a different plan. Not that David would be the one to be the full payment, bearing of, of God's judgment. But instead that there would be an altar. There would be an altar. Do you see what God's doing here? He's providing a substitute. David was willing to be the payment. And God is providing a substitute sacrifice to meet God's anger. And so David goes to Aramah and offers to buy the place where that sacrifice will be made. He insists on paying for it. Those famous words in verse 24, I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. That's a great coffee mug verse. That's a great kitchen calendar wall verse. You might think of it as a tattoo someday. But hold on, don't go get that tattoo just yet. David is doing something unique here. David is not your average Christian just talking about how sacrifice is good. David is certainly not giving us a great line for songwriting in the future. And he is certainly not giving 21st century Americans a great slogan for their building campaigns. It works like that. But David is unique here because David had sinned. God was angry. And though there would be forgiveness and payment made through a substitute, David must still in some ways pay because that's the nature of Old Testament sacrifices. Yes, there was a hint 
of how forgiveness worked. Forgiveness was pictured in those sacrifices. But someone still had to pay for the ox. It still had to be someone's goat. David had to pay. And he did. He paid. And he made sacrifice and burnt offerings to the Lord. And it worked. It was then and only then and in this way that God finally heard the prayers of the people and he relented of the plague in the land. This king, he's a good king. It's almost like he is priest-like. He is prophet-like at times. He is priest-like here as ever. And of course, he's the anointed king. Prophet, priest, king. It's all coming together in one at one place, at one time, this pivotal point in God's plan has this point man, David the shepherd, the king. In some ways, he's a kind of mediator before the people, praying for them, interceding for them, making sacrifice for them. He's the man, kind of like Abraham was the man at one time. And we should actually be reminded about Abraham here at this very point. Because the place where David made this sacrifice was Mount Moriah. That's where Abraham one day was about to sacrifice his son Isaac to the Lord. And God intervened and provided a substitute. Sacrifice. Same place. David was about to offer himself up when God provided here a substitute sacrifice in that same place. And in 1 Chronicles 22, after David makes these sacrifices and the plague relents, then David says, Here shall the house of the Lord God be, and here the altar of burnt offerings for Israel. Here's the place of the temple. In years to come, the temple will be built right there around this very place where once Abraham almost made sacrifice of his son, but God provided a substitute, and where David was ready to make sacrifice of himself, and, and God provided a substitute. Remember, back in 2 Samuel 7, David wanted to build God a house, a temple, a permanent place of his dwelling, a permanent place for his sacrifices. And God said, eh, good idea, but not yet, not you. God said, your son will build a house for my name. And his throne will be forever. I will establish the throne of his kingdom, your son, forever and ever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. Now we haven't yet heard that name, Solomon, be mentioned in 2 Samuel much, but it's coming if you read on in 1 Kings. You can see the batons being passed. David is not the one to build the house, but he's buying the place where the house of God will be built. Solomon will be the one who builds a house for God's name. And this will go on forever and ever. A Davidic son on the throne forever and ever. But it's not so hopeful. It's not so positive and encouraging. It is all the way to 1 Kings 11. That's the high point of the Old Testament. It's the glory day of the Davidic throne. And in 1 Kings 12, there's a divide among the people and the kingdom is torn in two irreparably forever and ever. Now separate thrones, now separate kings in separate kingdoms and sometimes even warring against each other in battle. Solomon wasn't the one. And even if he looked promising at times, he didn't. I mean, he sinned more than his father did, and he rarely repented. But even if he looked more like his father, David, the same would be true of him, that he died. That he died. That's the story of the Old Testament. The good ones don't last forever. They die. And the bad ones can't die fast enough. Get this one out of here. Get us another one. How's this going to work that God gave eternal promises for a rule and a reign of a Davidic son forever and ever, and they keep dying? Well, you know the answer, don't you? Listen to what the angel told Mary in Luke 1. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, 
and you shall call his name Jesus, God saves. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. That's the mystery of the Old Testament solved. An eternal king getting these eternal promises and bringing them to their zenith. You say, well, what about sacrifices? How does that fit into all this? Well, just as though Jesus was the true and final king, so also he is the true and final sacrifice for sins. That's what the cross is. It's a substitute sacrifice. That's the final word on God's plan. We're on another hill, just outside Jerusalem. Atonement was fully made for good, for all who would ever believe it to be true and cling to it as their only hope. This good shepherd laid his life down for the sheep. Not because he too had guilt and deserved to die. No, he was without guilt. And hence, he could truly be a perfect sacrifice for sins, for all time, for all peoples. Not just the sins of a little space and time. Not just the judgment of a famine here or three days of pestilence there. But all the judgment of the holy wrath of God for all the sins of all time for a people which no man can number from every tongue and tribe and kindred and nation. Don't don't miss how important 2 Samuel 24 is in the plan of God, how beautiful it is, how glorious the atonement and sacrifice that's made here is, how, how God once again, as the story always goes, provides a substitute that his wrath might be quenched and the people might live. And yet all that is just a glimpse. It is simply a foreshadow of what the final son of David came to bring. Here's what he came to bring and how it relates to what came before. Hebrews 10. In those sacrifices of old, the old covenant, there was a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you've not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you've taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I've come to do your will, O God. And then here's the punch in verse 10. And by that will, we have been sanctified, purified, made holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. If it was ever clear that God saves not by sword, not by spear, not by might, and not by many, it's right there at the cross of Jesus Christ. The world looks at it and says, that's foolish. The Jews look at it and they stumble over it. But those who are being saved know it is the power of God unto salvation. God saves, as he always has, not by might, not by sword, not by strength, not by many. Ultimately, he saves in his son, the one, the king, and him upon the cross. So when David said, I will not offer anything that costs me nothing, again, be careful before you get that tattooed on you. Know what it means for Jesus, first and foremost. You hear how different it is when we come to Jesus? I mean, Jesus offered a great cost, his whole body, his whole life. He offered his body for our salvation, and he offers that salvation to us without cost, without money, without price. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. So you don't come to God saying, I will not give him anything that doesn't cost me something. So I better start, you know, paying for it. Giving him more. Sacrificing more. No, 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 no. You come with nothing. Or you don't come at all. That's repentance and faith. And once you know his forgiveness, then... This world is transformed. Courage 
Looks like the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1, sitting there, not with sword, but about to get the sword, with no weapon in his hand, but only a quill pen, writing words down and saying things like, I will not be at all ashamed, but with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Because in his life and in his death, these things have been transformed. They're not threat to us anymore. In light of his life, in light of his death, we can lay our lives down as living sacrifices for him. We are to do that daily. Are you to offer something to the Lord that costs you something? Oh, you bet. It's not an altar on Mount Moriah. It's not some oxen. It's not building something there. You offer something to the Lord. Through the death of Jesus Christ received for the forgiveness of sins. And then you offer something to the Lord that is everything. Living sacrifices. Ongoing sacrifices. Breathing sacrifices. Moment by moment sacrifices. Our whole life now is to be one of worship. It's not here. It's not there. It's not sometimes. Because of Jesus Christ, worship has been transformed. Life has been transformed. His anger has been removed. And therefore, we can lay it all down. Let's pray for his help to do that. Well, Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ which cleanses us from sin. For grace that can remove our sins as far as the east is from the west and bury them in the deepest sea. Help us not to offer anything to you, Lord, that banks on it, that trusts in it. And yet, Lord, may we offer to you our whole lives as living sacrifices because Jesus gave us that and more in his life and death. Help us to believe that. Help us to encourage each other in it. Help us, Lord, to continue to confess it Help us to speak of it to a dying world. Help, of a, help us, Lord, to see it spread in this world. Help us, Lord, to recount it now even in song and believe it to be true in our innermost being that Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. And before the throne of God, now we have a great high priest who intercedes for us and who will one day bring us to himself. We thank you for these good promises in his name. Amen.